We have been studying about zeal in this series of lessons. We've talked about the, the elements that it takes to make us zealous people for the Lord. We've compared it to how a fire is made. To have a fire, you must have the proper environment so that it can burn. And you must have heat. And you must have fuel to burn. And the same thing is true of our zeal and service for God. Our environment must be pure. We need to look at ourselves and see what there is in us that's holding us back from being zealous. Get the sins out of our lives. And get the things around us that are pulling us back into sin out of our lives. Then we talked about how we need to draw near to God. He's the source of the, the heat that drives us. He, his zeal should inspire our zeal. And what we're doing in this zeal we're, we're living Christ in our lives. And we looked at a few characteristics of Christ that specifically applied to pointing our zeal in the right direction. So now what? Well, tonight we're really going to be going over some of the things we've already talked about. Because we're talking about tending the fire. Making sure it keeps going. Because when we become zealous, and we're, we, we've talked about how to protect it from Satan's lies and things like that, but we have to keep tending it, to keep it going. In Psalm 71, uh, in verses 17 and 18, he says, Oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. This zeal for God needs to last our whole lives. And so we need to keep stirring it up. A fire sometimes needs to be poked, doesn't it, to get it going again. And we need to look at ourselves every once in a while and see what needs to be adjusted in our life. We need to establish good habits in life and get rid of the bad habits. 
So let's look at some good habits that we should be adding to our life to help us continue in our zeal. We talked about this some this morning. We need constant reminders. Things that we already know, but we need to be reminded of. Peter again, in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, he says, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And so then he says he's about to die, so he's using his time now to stir them up. We need reminders to stir us up. Just because we already know something doesn't mean that it's in the foremost of our minds. And so we, we need these constant reminders. That's why every first day of the week we remember what the Lord did, right? Have we actually forgotten that Jesus died for us? No, not really. But it's not there at the foremost of our mind anymore. We need to get it there to where that's driving us in our lives. So he says, I'll always be ready to remind you of these things. We also need godly sorrow to stir us up to zeal. We all need correction from time to time. And rebuke. Paul in 1 Corinthians rebuked the church because they had a man there who was living with his father's wife and they weren't doing anything about it. And in 2 Corinthians, he wrote to them in chapter 7, and he talks about their reaction to what he said to them. And he says there, beginning in verse 10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What longing. What zeal. What avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. It produced godly sorrow in them. And he says that godly sorrow produced zeal in them. We need godly sorrow. When we're slipping away, 
When we're not we're doing the works of the Lord, and we see it, whether we're rebuked or we read in the scriptures and that convicts us of our sin, we need godly sorrow to stir us up to be zealous for the Lord. And sometimes some friendly competition can help. <laughs> this might not be the right word, really. But seeing other people's zeal should stir our zeal up. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians. Namely, that Achaia has been prepared since last year. And your zeal has stirred up most of them. He said, I've been telling these other churches, you're, you're already ready to give this gift. And that's motivated them to hurry up and, and get things ready. That's not necessarily competition. <laughs> but when you see other people who are living zealously, you don't want to be left out. You want to participate in that. And we always need to be looking toward the reward. In uh, Hebrews 11, we, we see this, him talking about Moses and why he lived the way he lived. Why did he suffer rather than live as royalty in Egypt? But it says he was looking to, to the reward. At the end of it, he says, he endured as seeing him who is unseen. What reward was he looking for? <laughs> Being with God. That's what we're looking forward to. Living eternally with God. And so that hope should be stirring us up. But then there's bad habits we need to get rid of. We can have things that we pursue in life that are really worthless. Even worse than worthless. Because there are things that are for us. We're selfish. We're not really living for God. And those things we need to get rid of out of our lives. In Acts 13, we see people who had a certain type of zeal. In verse 44 and 45, it says, The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. 
ngepha pa Jordan bebonisa ukuthi ubagcwa lomhawu bakuphike kwakhulu nomhawuli behlambalazi that these Jews have zeal lama Jordan ngaba inikisekelo yini another way to translate the word zeal is envy that's the wrong kind of zeal that's what they had it was driving them they weren't just sitting back and doing nothing they were very active but they had zeal for themselves They were jealous that the people were listening to Paul and Barnabas and not to them. That's worthless. If we care if people are listening to us, we've got the wrong attitude. I both, I both. We need people to listen to Christ. That's who we're living for. We need to stay away from zeal for the traditions of men. It's easy to get hold of, of something that you find very important. Maybe it's part of your culture. Maybe it's religion but it's not something that's truly found in the word of god well paul was like that in galatians 1 he talks about how zealous he was before he knew christ in verse 13 and 14 He says for you have heard my former manner of life in Judaism how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. He was zealous. But it wasn't for Christ. It was for the traditions of his fathers. But he changed, didn't he? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, He says there that when he's with the Jews he behaves as a Jew. But when he's with the Gentiles, those without law, he behaved like them. Why He didn't try to push his the traditions of his fathers on to them he was no longer zealous for that he was zealous for the gospel he says at the end of this passage i do all things for the sake of the gospel that i may become a fellow partaker of it He changed where his zeal was directed. And we need every once in a while to look at ourselves and see where is our zeal directed. And make sure it's truly for Christ. Something else we need to get out of our life is the habit of making rash commitments. <laughs> Committing to things before thinking them through very well. This was something that God warned the Israelites about. 
In Deuteronomy 23, uh, in verse 21 beginning, he says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. He says it's voluntary what you're saying. You, you're the one who's deciding to make that vow. You haven't sinned if you don't vow. So if you're going to make a vow, you'd better be sure you think it through really well. When we're feeling zealous, we may just make commitments before we really think it through. And that's not part of the wisdom that comes through godly zeal. We need to stay away from acting on our assumptions. David, the king, was a zealous man. And he had a great idea. In 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. David had the idea he was going to build a house for God. The temple. It was a great idea. Even God told him, you did well that you thought about this. Nathan couldn't see that there could possibly be anything wrong with that. But in the next verse, it says, But in the same night the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? And then he asks the question, Have I ever given you this idea that I wanted it to be done? Well, <laughs> no. But it sure seems like a good thing to do. And in fact, it was a good thing to do once God said it was. But God told David, you're not the one who's going to do it. Your son will do it. But we can't just assume that God is happy with what we want to do for him in our zeal. We have to go to the Word and see what does He want us to do. And so, 
we, we have to get these bad habits out of our life while we're adding the good habits in. Yeah. Um, but another way to tend or to stir up the zeal in us over time is by imitating our heroes. That's why Hebrews 11 was written. These are examples to be imitated. And a hero is basically just somebody who makes sacrifices. They demonstrate godly virtues in some big way. The Bible's full of them. We need to get to know them so that we can imitate those good things in them. You think about David again. He's, he's a hero demonstrating courage, isn't he? He demonstrates a lot of other things, but that's one thing we can pull out. We can look at Noah. A hero demonstrating obedience to God. You look at Abraham, who's called out as a hero of faith. Of course, all of these are heroes of faith. But we, we need to, to look at these people and see the good things in them that God saw in them and imitate those things in our lives. And when we get to know them, when we study about them, they keep us humble. Because they were humble. True heroes are always humble. In Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Paul, who is a great hero, somebody who he even tells us to imitate him. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God, uh, surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Who is he drawing attention to? Not to himself, but to God. And you see that all through his writings. He will talk about himself sometimes and the things that he's been through. But he's always pointing towards this is the grace of God. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And getting to know about these heroes helps us to be optimistic when we see our brethren failing or even when we're failing. Was Noah perfect? Now we know about him getting drunk, don't we? What about Sarah? She's, she's pointed out as a hero of faith. But she laughed at God when he told her she was going to have a child. What about Samson? Man, he was messed up. <laughs> he would go to prostitutes. He, he was very unwise and 
his choice of wife and he did a lot of really stupid things. <laughs> and yet Hebrews 11 lists him as one of the heroes of faith. That helps us realize we, even though we're not perfect, even though we're failing, that doesn't mean we're not going to make it. We can stir up that zeal again. We can have hope for our brethren when we see them having troubles. We can be optimistic when we get to know them. And getting to know these heroes, it teaches us that we must leave the past behind and press on. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul said, more, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. All those things in his past, whether good or bad, they're garbage. He's not worried about that. He's pressing on. He's looking to Christ. He's looking to the goal. That's what we must do as well. But our main hero that we're going to look at throughout our life is Christ. He's the perfect hero. He didn't make any mistakes. He shows us in a big way, in the biggest way, what sacrifice really is. He demonstrates all of the virtues that we need in our lives. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix our eyes on him. He is the example and he's the goal. Why did he do what he did? Why was the Because of the joy that was set before him. He had the end in mind. Why is Life with us forever. Because we've been saved through his sacrifice. And that's why we press on. That's why we have enduring zeal. Because our eyes are fixed on that hope. We must stir up again our zeal by fixing our hope on the things above. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, 
He says, this is why we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. This hope is why we labor. Why do we keep on working for the Lord? Because of our hope in Christ. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 5, he says, Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone ha has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. Here's somebody in a bad situation. She's a widow indeed. That means her husband has died. She has no children. Nobody to take care of her. That's a terrible situation, isn't mm -hmm. it? But she continues in prayers night and day because of the hope which is on God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 13, he says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds for action. When you're thinking about this hope, that should motivate you to work with that goal in mind. What am I going to do in order to achieve that hope? How am I going to live? Keep sober in spirit. We're not there yet. We're here. We have temptations. We have things that need to get done now. Don't get so wrapped up in thinking about heaven that you forget where you are. But keep that goal in mind. Fix your hope completely on the grace of God. There's going to be a day when we stand before the throne to be judged. People who've been through matric exams, it's tough to wait for your results, isn't it? Because you don't really know how you did. Because that was up to you. <laughs> but if we're in Christ, on the day we stand to be examined, we all get a hundred percent pass. Because he's the one who took the test for us. Our hope must be completely on His grace. Because we're not going to make it any other way. Let's live our lives devoted to Him. This grace of God we're looking forward to. Revelation 21 verse 4. It says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. As the soul is near the zone, give me a turn now. Go for a side of a phone, no double, no cut, no clue, no side of a phone. Isn't that what we want? We want to live this eternal, blessed life with God. 
That means living zealously for the Lord now. We need to clear out all of the things in our lives so that, we, that are holding us back from being zealous. When we don't clear things out, things go wrong. <laughs> We need to draw near to God so He can light our fire of zeal and keep adding the fuel that is this character of Christ. We need to protect that zeal so that Satan can't dump any water on it and put it out. So that it stays within the proper limits that God has set for our zeal. And we need to use that zeal. <coughs> like fire drives the steam engine that pulls a train. Our zeal needs to be driving us to work. To to, to do good deeds, <inaudible> to teach others the gospel, <inaudible> to spread our zeal to others. <inaudible> and when you start to die down in your zeal, <inaudible> poke it. <laughs> Stir it up. Get your mind back on track. So that we can continue throughout life being zealous, having lasting zeal, zeal that's from God, done in God's way.